Good morning. Anyone going to join me this morning? Good morning, Rebecca. Glad you're here. Been thinking about you and your family. Hoping you're all doing okay. Well, I don't know what it looks like from your end, but I'm noticing that the picture this morning is a little bit jerky. How is the sound? Is the sound doing okay? Good. You may notice uh, below the title that I put for this morning's worship, I um, went ahead and wrote in the um, words to the hymn so that you can find them that way. I hope you can find below the title, which was Cardindale Community UCC Worship or something like that for this morning. So. Good morning, Jerry and family. I'm glad to see you here. And John, good morning to you. I'm guessing that you've made sure the link on the church's Facebook page is now open. Thank you for doing that. Good morning, Pat. Glad to see you here this morning as well. And Mary and family. Hello, Brian. Glad you're here. I was trying to figure out earlier yesterday how I could post the uh, words to our music on a some type of uh, mounting uh, in front of the camera. And uh, so I was trying that. And the end result was that the sound was pretty pathetic. I'm not exactly sure where the speaker is on my computer, but wherever it was, uh, it was um, being covered up a little bit. And I have a, another friend who plays his guitar uh, and uh, as part of worship, but he sets his uh, iPhone up a little further away and has a wider angle of shot. And the further away he gets from the uh, microphone, the wonkier the sound gets. And so uh, I gave up on posting uh, the words on some type of uh, sign um, and instead I posted the words uh, below the title that I put on the Facebook page for this. Thank you for the sound check Mary and good morning Heidi. How are you? Uh, is anyone in your family joining us this morning? You don't have to answer that. Don't embarrass anybody. So. I'm, I'm glad you're all here with me this morning. Uh, Jean is running late, but she'll be down any moment now. She slept in this morning. 
and uh, uh, which is just fine as far as I'm concerned. That gave me a chance to uh, walk through everything sitting here at my dining room table in our small home. Uh, I've set up in the dining room with Jean's Fiesta Ware behind us in the cabinet and her collection of sunflowers above me on top of the cabinet. So uh, I was able to, to practice a little bit this morning. <clears throat> so I don't know whether the whole world is on Facebook this morning or something because but um, the picture that I am looking of myself as it being a little bit jumpy. So I hope that that doesn't uh, show up that badly for you as well. This is my very favorite stole. I don't have very many stoles anymore. When I retired, oh, it's been 14 years ago, I guess now, uh, I gave my stoles away to a young man who was just starting ministry and gave most of my book collection away because I didn't think I was going to need any of this stuff. Uh, so. Uh, I'm down to just a, a few stoles that were handmade ones uh, for the most part uh, that people had made for me. So. So Pat has some suggestions for some different technology. We maybe need to have a conversation about that. Good morning, Dean and Beth. Dean, I'm sorry for your loss. I've been thinking about you and your family. Uh, good morning, Nancy. Good, good to see you this morning. Jean says hello as well as she has joined us a few moments ago. Pat, now that I've uh, figured out Facebook Live, I get a little bit anxious thinking about learning something new. Uh, just sharing that with you. So uh, that doesn't mean I can't because I learned this much. Well, good morning to all of you. It is 1030 and we will begin worship shortly. Uh, I am. Um, Posting this from my own Facebook page, uh, John has uh, is co-posting it on the community church page as well. So I don't know um, which who of you are joining us uh, on the church's page, but I'm glad you're with me this morning as we join together in worship. As I shared with a, a few of you a little while ago. Uh, I have posted the words to some of our music uh, on our Facebook page, and I posted them uh, in a, a section just below the title uh, for this morning, which is the date and Community Church UCC worship. Uh, John Onstead had suggested to me last night that there's a place to put notes in there and if you wanted to, if I wanted to put some type of description, so instead of description, uh, I put the words to uh, three of the songs we're going to sing this morning. Didn't put the words of the first one in because, uh, well, one, they're simple, and two, they're more familiar with those of you who have worshipped with us in the past. We uh, try to. Um, use a praise song to begin worship on on Sunday mornings. And uh, 
we tend to just use the same one for the month. And the one I've been using is simply praise God, praise God, praise God in the morning, praise God at noontime, praise God when the sun goes down. And then a second and a third verse, loving God and serving God. Praise God, praise God, praise God in the morning, praise God at noontime, praise God, praise God, praise God when the sun goes down. You may join if you'd like. Love God, love God, love God in the morning, love God at noontime, love God. Love God, love God when the sun goes down. Serve God, serve God, serve God, serve God in the morning, serve God at noon time. Serve God, serve God, serve God when the sun goes down. The early church <clears throat> often referred to itself as the way. Friends, we are also travelers on the way. So what shall we do? Let's begin by praising God who hears our prayers, who draws near to us and brings life out of death. How shall we live? with confidence as God's beloved children, with security and joy for God's saving grace. And how shall we praise? Well, folks, let's praise God with hearts filled with love and thanks. Let us pray. Loving God, we welcome your living presence in our midst. Share our joys and our thanks for the life that you give us. Walk with us, dance among us, pray with us, and most of all, shower us with your love. Amen. Do Lord. Lord, oh do, Lord, oh do remember me, oh Lord, oh do, Lord, oh do, Lord, oh do remember me. Lord, oh do, Lord, oh do remember me, look away beyond the blue. I've got a home in the glory land that outshines the sun. I've got a home in the glory land that outshines the sun. I've got a home in the glory land that outshines the sun. Look away beyond the blue. Lord, oh do, Lord, oh do remember me, oh Lord, oh do, Lord, oh do, Lord, oh do remember me. Lord, oh do, Lord, oh do remember me, look away beyond the balloon. I Jesus as my Savior you take him to. I took Jesus as my Savior you take him to. I took Jesus as my Savior you take him to. Look away beyond the balloon. Lord, oh do Lord. Oh, do you remember me, oh Lord, I do, oh, oh do, Lord, oh, oh do remember me, oh, Lord, oh 
do, Lord, oh, do you remember me? Look away beyond the blue. Look away beyond the blue. Let us pray. Heavenly One, we give thanks that you are our companion on our journeys, even when we don't recognize you. We yearn for your love and grace, and we seek your wisdom and guidance. We are filled with joy when you are with us. And sometimes we don't want to share the love we experience with others. Forgive us, dear one, and remind us again that your love is for the entire world. Help us to share more fully the hope and joy of your love so that others with spiritual hungers may be filled through our witness to your grace. Amen. God often comes to us in ways we don't expect or recognize, and the Risen One reaches us in surprising ways as we travel our faith roads, folks. May the word of our still speaking God continue to burn in our hearts. Amen. Our scripture reading for this morning is Luke 24, Verses 13 to 35. It's a long reading. It's a long story. But it's a familiar one. Now on that same day, a couple of disciples were going to the village called Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem, and talking with each other about all these things that had happened. While they were talking and discussing, Jesus himself came near and went with them, but their eyes were kept from recognizing him. And he said to them, what are you discussing with each other while you walk along? They stood still looking sad. Then one of them, whose name was Cleophas, answered him, are you the only stranger in Jerusalem who does not know the things that have taken place there in these days? And he asked them, oh, what things? And they replied, the things about Jesus of Nazareth, who was a prophet mighty in deed and word before God and all the people and how our chief priests and leaders handed him over to be condemned to death and crucified him. But we had hoped that he was the one to redeem Israel. Yes, and beside all this, it's now the third day since these things took place. Moreover, some women of our group astounded us. They were at the tomb early this morning, and when they did not find his body there, they came back and told us that they had indeed seen a vision of angels who said he was alive. Some of those who were with us went to the tomb and found it just as the women had said, but they did not see him. Then he said to them, that is the stranger on the road, then he said to them, oh, how foolish you are, and how slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have declared. Was it not necessary that the Messiah should suffer these things and then enter into his glory? And then beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he interpreted to them the things about himself in all the scriptures. As they came near the village to which they were going, he walked on ahead as if he were going on. But they urged him strongly, saying, Stay with us, 
because it is almost evening and the day is now nearly over. So he went in and stayed with them. And when he was at table with them, he took bread, blessed and broke it and gave it to them. Then their eyes were opened and they recognized him and he vanished from their sight. They said to one another, were not our hearts burning within us when he was talking to us on the road while he was opening the scriptures to us? That same hour they got up and returned to Jerusalem and they found the eleven and their companions gathered together. They were saying, the Lord has risen indeed and he has appeared to Simon when they told him what had happened on the road and how they had been and how he had been made known to them in the breaking of the bread. Folks, this is the word of God, and it can be trusted and believed. I don't realize how much I rock back and forth until I see myself on screen. Like most of you, I am physically isolating, but not socially isolating. It used to be that I would stay six feet away from people, but now that I've seen that study about how far a sneeze can go, I'm staying eight feet or more away. And I hear people saying to me things like, when all this is over, or, when things get back to normal. But I doubt that things will ever get back to normal, folks. At least not the normal that we knew before COVID-19 raised its ugly head. People couldn't imagine celebrating Easter without being together, but we figured out how to do it. And by last Sunday, when Heidi Hawkinson Penny led our worship, it was beginning to feel like a new normal was evolving. And I'm sure that it will continue to evolve as we figure out how to worship in different ways and how to do our ministry in our Carbondale community in different ways. Our Blessing Box ministry continues to be strong thanks to a couple of community-wide food drives that took place just before COVID-19 showed up. And of course, as you do your shopping, you can always do some extra shopping to replenish our cell shelves. I was by the blessing box yesterday and our shelves were full. I added a couple loaves of homemade bread to the shelves. Our diaconate's been making phone calls to make sure those in our immediate circles are doing okay. And please let them know if there are some gaps that need filled. And our latest project, <clears throat> the Prayer Ribbon Cross, continues to expand as people stop and add their own prayer ribbons and concerns to the cross for us to pray. Again, when I drove by yesterday, our cross is absolutely packed with ribbons. One of the things I've been amazed about is the breadth of our online worshiping community. The majority of our regular members have figured out how to join us, and the rest of our members are getting hard copies of the service. And then there's the children and the grandchildren of some of our regular and mostly our senior citizen worshipers who are now finding ways to join us. For some, it's because of a new need caused by the stresses of COVID-19. For others, it's the ability to worship from home or to be able to worship in a more convenient time slot. And then there are people who are showing up because they know you 
or they know Jean or me, or they're connected to the church and to church members in some other way. There's a few whose home church have not found a way to have an online presence yet. And so they have found us that way. Well, to all of you, welcome. I'm glad you're here. I wonder what life might have felt like as Jesus's disciples followed him as he turned in his ministry toward Jerusalem. No doubt they could sense that there was going to be trouble ahead. And I don't doubt that some of the disciples were saying among themselves, if we can only get beyond this backlash with the Jerusalem officials, and if only we can get through Passover without a major flare up, we can get back out of Jerusalem and back into the hill country. Then things will get back to normal. There's that phrase again. But it was Thomas, the realist, who said, let's go die with Jesus in Jerusalem. Today's scripture reading is a conversation among two disciples who were trying to figure out what to do now as they headed home to Emmaus after Jesus's crucifixion. Fleeing the chaos and danger of Jerusalem, they were trying to sort out what had happened and what that would mean to them as lovers and disciples of Jesus. Those of you that have heard me preach over the past couple of years are aware of how I pay attention to the male-oriented culture of Jesus's time. This bias in favor of men is something that we see throughout the Bible. Doesn't mean that the Bible thinks it should be that way. It's just that that's the way the culture of Jesus's time and of Bible times was. And some in the church, even today, have used this bias as a way to diminish the role of women in the church and in our society. And I tried to remove this cultural bias of Jesus's era from my thinking and preaching as much as possible. Well, keeping this bias in mind, let's look at this morning's scripture about a couple of disciples meeting Jesus on the Emmaus Road. But let me ask you a question. What if instead of a couple of disciples, it was really a disciples couple that Jesus met on the road? You see, that changes the focus, and it changes the way I think about this passage. I used to picture two men in their loose robes and sandals, walking down a dusty road, heading home after Passover. But it could have just as easily been a married couple heading home, having witnessed the crucifixion of their beloved rabbi and sharing their grief with each other as they walked. It could have been. In fact, it makes more sense looking at it this way. Or perhaps it was a couple of friends or neighbors leaving Jerusalem, a place of hope turned to despair, a place of perplexity and confusion, a place where some were telling tales that were unbelievable and they were going home they were going to try to get their lives back to normal. Last week, Heidi shared the story of Thomas, whom we call the doubter, as if we weren't also one from time to time. For Thomas, seeing Jesus, seeing his wounds, helped him to believe. That's a favorite slogan, Seeing is believing. But as we hear this morning's scripture, let me suggest another thought. 
Sometimes our believing helps us see. One of the things that made Jesus so popular was that when he was around, amazing things seemed to happen. From his very first miracle of turning some giant vessels of water into wine at a wedding reception, to his last miracle of opening a tomb to welcome his four days old dead friend Lazarus back into life. Wherever Jesus was, people experienced amazing and unexplained things. But beginning on Easter, there was a radical shift in the way people experienced and did things. The gardener called out Mary's name, and she suddenly believed it was the risen Lord, even before she turned around. The disciples were in hiding in a rented room, and they heard Jesus' favorite greeting, peace be with you, and they suddenly believed. No, they knew he was present to them. Even before they saw their risen Lord, their eyes were opened. And today, we hear a disciples couple, or a couple of disciples, walking the dusty road to Emmaus with a stranger, telling him of their experiences with Jesus, the one who might have been. And later, when they reflected back on that walk, they remembered how their very hearts were warmed as this stranger shared a new understanding of ancient scriptures just like Jesus had. At their journey's end, they extended the hospitality of their home and invited him in to share the evening meal. Then, this stranger broke and blessed the bread, something they had seen their Lord do on many occasions. And suddenly they knew who was at their table. Suddenly they knew that Christ indeed was risen. Believing led them to see. And what about our lives? Do we have to see things in order to believe? If that were the case, Christianity would have long ago died out. It would have been limited <clears throat> to a few hundred people at best, open only to those who personally experienced the risen Christ. But thankfully, that's not the way it happened. A stranger was invited to offer the blessing over the meal. He broke the bread, and suddenly those disciples experienced Christ's resurrection. I don't know what it means, but Scripture says that Jesus then disappeared from their midst. But I do understand the excitement of their renewed faith as they immediately turned around and raced back to Jerusalem to be witnesses to a new and evolving normal. Today, I can believe that Christ is risen, not because I see him physically, I don't, but because I see all of these acts of caring and service going on in Christ's name by disciples in our communities and throughout the world. And yet, don't we still pray for miracles as a way to reinforce our beliefs? And if they don't come, does it destroy our faith? Well, sometimes it actually does. When I first began ministry nearly 50 years ago now, I was a modern day circuit rider. I was serving six small rural churches in northeastern Pennsylvania. 
In one of those congregations, a much loved member had a massive stroke. She lingered in a coma for nearly a week before she died. Her husband hardly left her bedside during the entire time. Well, he never recovered from her death because he felt that it was his fault. He was convinced that if he had only prayed harder and longer, that God would have surely responded and saved her. And because he didn't see the desired result, his faith was crushed. Either he didn't pray hard enough or God was not God and he could handle neither. In the last few weeks, all across our country and around the world, actually, our prayer chains and prayer teams have been working overtime as we lift up people who are ill or who are feeling the strains and stresses of sheltering in place as we battle COVID-19. I'm delighted with our Carbondale community's response to our prayer cross. And daily we lift up our ribbons to God. We don't know what those issues are, but those of us who pray believe that God does. And we pray not because we expect God to change physics, but because we know that God will be with us as we struggle through life's issues. We may want and hope that God will step in and intervene in our particular prayer, but mostly we are comforted in knowing that God joins us in our pain and in our personal day-to-day -day struggles and on our various faith journeys. And the simple act of inviting God to journey with us on our Emmaus roads as a way of opening us up to God in unexpected ways. It wasn't that long ago when we were resisting the idea of not worshiping in our building on Sunday morning. But that was a road that we had to travel as we figured out how we can be together as a community of faith while we are still physically apart. And quite frankly, it didn't take us too long to figure out how to do that. <clears throat> Step two on our COVID-19 Emmaus Road was when we began to figure out how we can stay strong in our ministry. Individually and in small phone and email conversations, we have discovered an amazing number of ways to support each other as we struggle with our changing pandemic world. And now we're trying to figure out how we can further embrace and support our community and our neighbors and how we can be the church without our building being the focal point. For we know that our, <clears throat> our building is not our spiritual home. Our spiritual home is our faith in Christ Jesus. Sometimes we are the ones struggling and in despair and someone else walks the road with us, bringing us Christ's presence and power. And sometimes it's the other way around, and we become Christ to them. But either way, we know where our spiritual home is, and it's with Christ. One of the people on my prayer list is the granddaughter of a former church member. The church member lives in Marysville. I've been praying for her granddaughter's baby, William, 
who for who is now 45 days old, I think, and who has been in the hospital since birth, dealing with a major heart issue and various infections. William's mother told the story earlier this week about how her smartphone seems to know where she is and where she's going. And for the last month and a half, she has spent more time at the hospital than at home. No surprise there. Many nights, <clears throat> she slept through the night in William's room. And only recently has she been able to occasionally sleep in her own bed. On Wednesday morning, she wrote in her uh, Facebook journal how she got into her car to go to the hospital early that morning. And her phone reported 17 minutes to home. And then her phone proceeded to highlight the directions on how to get to the hospital. At first he thought, how sad that my phone thinks I live at the hospital. He, she said, which I basically do right now. But then I realized that it was right. She went on to write, home is where my heart is. And William is my heart. William is my home. Folks, I believe that the same message is true for us. For each one of us is in the heart of God, is in the heart of Christ. And wherever we are, and whatever life's challenges may be, we will find our spiritual home in Christ's heart. And if we believe that, we'll also be able to see where we are going. I personally don't think that life is going to get back to normal anytime soon, if ever. But I do believe that wherever this journey takes me and wherever this journey takes you, that we will find our home in the heart of the risen one, in the heart of the risen one. In these words this morning, may you find the word of God for you. Amen. Back in the 70s, a minister and a music director by the name of Avery and Marsh wrote a song called We Are the Church, which uh, began, became quite popular back then. And I wouldn't be surprised if many of you sang it in church and in vacation Bible school and in Sunday school back then. And so I'm hoping that some of you will still remember it. The chorus goes this way. I am the church. You are the church. We are the church together. All who follow Jesus all around the world. Yes, we're the church together. The church is not a building, the church is not a steeple, the church is not a resting place, the church is the people. I am the church, you are the church, we are the church together. All who follow Jesus all around the world, yes, we're the church together. We're many kinds of people with many kinds of faces, all colors and all ages too, from all times and places. For I am the church, you are the church, we are the church together. 
All who follow Jesus all around the world. Yes, we're the church together. Yes, we're the church together. Let us pray together. Holy God, we give thanks that wherever we are on life's journey, regardless of the ups and downs, the hills and valleys that we experience, that you are with us lighting our way when life is darkness, picking us up when we fall, guiding us back on our paths when we wander off. You are our home, and we are happy to come home to you. For through the life, the teachings, and the ministry of Jesus, we now have a roadmap to finding our way home. We know, O oh God, that in this time of physical separation, that it's more challenging for some of us than it is for others. Where there is anger or frustration, help calm our spirits. Where there is emptiness and loneliness, come to us, walk with us, be our companions. And when we feel lost, be a light on our paths and show us what it is that you're calling us to be and do. And now, Holy One, in this time of silence, we pray our church's prayer list and we lift up our personal prayer list knowing that you already know what it is for which we pray. But hear us in this time of silence. Surround all those we lift up, holy God, with your loving grace and your healing presence. And hear us now as we pray together the prayer that Jesus taught his disciples when he said, Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Before we sing our closing song, I want to remind our church members of your tithes and your offerings. Therefore, the budget 
of the church. Also want to remind you that uh, of our special offering for April and May, and for those others of you listening in, we um, not only do we uh, receive offerings for our operating budget, but every month we do special offerings. And for April and May, uh, the offering has always been for scholarships for White Memorial Camp. And so I want to remind folks uh, to be sure and send those offerings in as well. And since we uh, can't be together to take up our offering, uh, please remember to mail your offering in to Post Office Box 389, Carbondale, Kansas 66414. And we're gonna, in closing, we're gonna sing just a closer walk with the, so I was practicing earlier this morning I couldn't get the tune in my head that's because I was trying to put different words in and a different tune and so I uh, give me a second here to make sure I'm uh, do- gonna pick this right just a closer walk with the Granted, Jesus is my plea. Daily walking close to thee. Let it be. Lord, let it be. I am weak. Thou art strong. Jesus, keep me from all wrong. I'll be satisfied as long as I walk, dear Lord, close to thee. Just a closer walk with thee. Granted, Jesus is my plea. Daily walking close to thee. Let it be. Through this world of toils and snares. If I falter, Lord, who cares? Who with me my burden shares? Only Just a closer walk with me. Granted, Jesus is my plea. Daily walking close to thee. Let it be. Let it be, dear Lord, let it be. Well, I almost ran out of voice before I ran out of words this morning. Glad I made it. And now, folks, in the name of God who creates and has created all of life, in the name of Jesus Christ, who through his life showed us the way to live our lives. In the name of the Holy Spirit, who asks us for that light, that life, and shines on us and shows us the way. You all go in peace, share the good news, be the good news, be the church of Jesus Christ. 
wherever you are. Amen. Thank you, folks, for joining with me this morning in worship. Amen. Goodbye. Call me or send me a note if I can be of support.